So I'm a postdoctoral research fellow with the um, IPIL group. Um, and thanks very much to Matt Rimmer for running today's event. Um, it's been really useful to get me thinking more about bioprinting because my main area is in food and agricultural law as opposed to um, 3D printing. So it's, it's been useful to transfer my skills across and that provides me with a pretty unique perspective. So a starting point for thinking about 3D printed food, its implications and possible regulatory requirements is how it's framed in mainstream media. Um, and that's because this is really the first um, exposure many citizens will have um, to the technology and, and how it's being framed. And there's been a few um, discourse analyses conducted um, around in different periods of time in different countries, but basically the finding is that um, a lot of media constructions on 3D printed food are positive and futuristic. They play up the novelty of it, um, but most of the time there isn't um, a, a fear being or, or uncertainty or, or unsafety isn't really entering the, into the discourse um, in a mainstream way. Um, so one key discourse within the 3D printed food area is that 3D printed food provides can be a way to um, make people more food secure. And in particular, because food insecurity is experienced in different ways, including in obesity and micronutrient deficiency, but the focus in the media is on starvation, which is quite typical of um, emerging technologies um, tend to um, be positioned as a solution to um, quite a persistent issue. So the main gist of this narrative is that 3D printed food can be utilised to solve or at least address starvation by improving the availability of nutritious foods with less environmental impacts. And I have some of these, um, some of the snapshots of some of the headlines that I've come across. So the use of these over the top audacious kind of public claims regarding 3D printed Food and food security is consistent with sociological studies on expectations in uh, science and technology. So this body of work explores how expectations are a key element in the shaping of innovation and in the funding of innovation. And so you'll see um, Matthew picked up on this before, but there's generally a cycle of hype um, and then a dis part with disappointment where the hype's not quite reached and then it kind of plateaus. That's a general model. Um, so a, there is a degree of hype that is necessary and required for emerging technologies um, in order to attract this initial attention and the funding required. Um, and correspondingly, there's generally a degree of underperformance as a result if you compare it to the hype. So acknowledging that that is an important part of um, attracting funding and, and traction around a project and also you have to have the expectation that things will work out well in order to want to spend your time and, and money on um, a new technology. Putting that aside for a moment, there are a few key limitations with 3D printed um, food and there is a, a, an underlying message or, or critique that could be made of the claims that 3D printed food will end hunger. So firstly, malnutrition or starvation is much more complicated issue than um, that can be fixed by one technology alone or even technology. It is much more of a social and a political and an economic issue than it is one of enough food being produced because we actually produce enough food to feed everyone. Um, yet we have you know, one billion people who are obese or overweight and one billion people who are starving and one third of all our food is wasted. So there really is a need for, I would argue, some kind of regulatory interventions into this social, political and economic system that has created and enabled um, starvation. So the problem is distributional and we're not really going to fix that um, through creating a technology that can print food. And this feeds into my second point, which is that it's unlikely that food insecure households, which tend to be found in rural areas of developing countries, it's unlikely that they're going to be able to afford a 3D printer. If they're in remote areas, it's unlikely that they're going to have an access to a community hub. I mean, it's possible, but um, again, it's somewhat unlikely given the internet still hasn't reached um, these co many corners of the globe. It's also unlikely that they'll have enough stable income to be able to buy the um, food, the ink cartridges, if you will, that you need to put into the printer. So that's something that is often missed in the hunger, 3D printing will solve hunger, is you actually need food in the first place to print it. Um, so it's a bit, it is a little bit funny when you start to, um, when you start to unpick these assumptions. Um, and then a third point 
is to um, is that there's a lot of a focus on 3D printing improving nutrition because there's this idea that you can get a synthesized food product and put nutrients in it and then someone can maybe this is a futuristic idea but scan their body and figure out what nutrients they need and then print dishes based on that that meet what their nutrient profile now a critique of that um, which 3d printing is yet to pick up on that stems from nutritional science is that this focus on nutrients is quite a reductionist view of food and bodies and the context in which food um, is eaten and the individual body interacts with um, the food. So I have a quote from Marion Nessel on this slide about it, but essentially it's this idea that if we take a reductionist approach to the biomarkers in food and say that these things equal health, um, that's an, actually a very uncertain claim and it's quite deterministic and simple to say that. Um, and there actually isn't a lot of evidence that supports that. So if, um, th that the nutrient claim has got some the reason why um, Marion and others propose that that has really taken our imagination is one, because we like simple solutions, and two, um, it feeds into companies because they can add omega-3 to their white bread instead of actually only providing, say, whole grain bread. They can just add omega-3 to a white bread product and then say it's been reformulated in a way that um, is better for you nutritionally. You can see that again with superfood um, marketing as well. So taking a more realistic view of what we can do with 3D printing um, and food, I've, come, I've got the dimensions of food security on one side, some of the converging challenges around that particular dimension of food security, and then the, the positive potential contributions that 3D printing could make. And so in terms of food availability, we're thinking there about the amount of food being produced and the amount of food imported. Um, yes, I think 3D printing could improve access to rural and urban infrastructure, including um, aquaponics, which is great potential, especially in claiming uh, changing climate, but it's also expensive right now because everyone has to buy um, expensive pipes and et cetera. So I do see that, especially in the urban um, space because it, printers might be more accessible there, but in vertical farming systems, that kind of thing, 3D printers will be really um, useful for that kind of infrastructure. May improve access to small tools, I, I, but I mean, again, a lot of farmers, a lot of low income farmers make their own tools in ways that might not meet the design standards of say a white person in Silicon Valley. Um, they tend to create, be quite creative with the tools that they create that might not meet a standardized design and might not suit their ecological conditions. Um, so also could contribute to the development of less resource intensive products if we're thinking about um, meat there, which I'll touch on in a second, well I'll talk about. Um, food access, here we're really thinking about poverty and um, that enabling of decentralised production could really improve incomes and therefore improve your ability to purchase food, um, though I should note that there's also that potential for job losses, but if you have the right regulatory safety nets in place, um, tech, tech, that could be resolved uh, as long as we preempt it. Um, food use, here you're thinking about food safety, nutrition and culture, um, and there is an, um, an issue with um, whether the 3D printed food will meet different cultural requirements in a religious sense, which I will return to. But um, generally, um, 3D printing could improve um, access to preservation and processing technologies in developing countries, potentially by reducing the cost of manufacturing, which is really important because one, when the, they lose most of their food in developing countries post harvest, but before consumption. So, and a, lot, a big reason for that is a lack of storage and, and a lack of storage um, processing technologies. So that could really, um, that could be really significant in that area. Um, and also for people with swallowing and chewing issues, we could see that 3D printed food um, could be useful there for making sure that they have access to a range of nutrients that they can swallow. Now again, I know I just critiqued that, but there is a potential there, um, especially with swallowing and chewing issues. Um, in terms of food stability, um, in times of disasters or violent conflicts, if the, um, the area has prepared accordingly, they, would, they may have 3D printers and the right kinds of um, inputs that would enable you to have a stable food supply despite the conflict or despite the disaster, but that would require a level of um, preparation first. Okay, so I've chosen red as a bit of a theme for my slides, which is a bit morbid, um, but stick with me. So I've become incredibly interested in 3D printing of synthetic meat because out of all the ways that 3D printing could contribute to food security, this is the one 
um, where most of the claims are made and it's also the one that's um, seemingly most exciting because we know that there's significant issues um, with intensive livestock production. So in terms of future um, food security, I see this as possibly the main area that 3D printing um, will be useful and basically there's two main ways that um, 3D printing comes into the synthetic meat space. Um, first, 3D, 3D printers could be used to um, reconstitute low value meat products, so trimmings or insects or things like that make them more palatable. Um, the other way is um, if you use, for instance, tissue engineering um, and you create that and then you put that, you synthesize that and you put that through the 3D printer, the texture of the meat is a really important um, aspect of whether we enjoy food or not. And so the 3D printer will help us potentially reach a more meat-like texture and um, increase the consumer acceptability of that product. Um, there's a range of startups in this space working on pork, fish, turkey, um, egg whites, jelly, you name it. Um, yeah, I know, gelatin, yeah, definitely. So that's, so there's a lot of similarities also in this area between regenerative medicine and, and organ printing and, and the meat um, printing. So um, I'll return to that point in a second. So I guess I see this as a main contribution because even though food insecure people won't be printing meat for the reasons I've previously discussed, access, et cetera, um, the fact that there's be a freeing up of a significant amount of resources if we shifted towards um, 3D printed synthetic meat products um, means that those resources might be used in ways that actually um, provide food for people as opposed to providing food for animals, for instance, or providing water for animals. We can free up a range of resources that with the right kinds of regulatory frameworks and institutional support, we could redistribute those resources in a way that improved food security, which as I said, is a distributional issue largely. So that's where I see the significant aspect of this. And I should note also that it's likely to result in a decreased suffering of animals, um, even though that doesn't really come that idea of animal suffering doesn't really come into the food security space, as you can imagine. So, um, and of course, um, reducing the effects of climate change by reducing livestock production. So there's a range of positions I've seen so far, and I did a preliminary discourse analysis on the in Australian literature and on Australian media. And these are some of the, I've got some driving forces and some counter forces. I'm just gonna touch on one or two of these. Um, so in terms of animal welfare and rights, it's that, you know, that I, it's a very attractive, exciting idea of that you get to eat meat and not feel that guilt or cognitive dissonance as you're eating meat. Um, so it's victimless. Um, so there's that aspect to it. It's quite a utilitarian approach because some animals will still be um, dying. And I'll return again to that point in a little bit. Um, in terms of counter forces, um, consumer acceptability is quite a, a quite, could be an issue as it was with um, genetically modified food. But then again, um, as I've said, the initial media has been really positive, whereas with um, GM food, it was a little bit more conflicted from the start. And that's possibly because of the types of actors that were involved earlier on in GM, as opposed to um, there's more tech startups involved in the synthetic meat space, whereas with um, agricultural inputs, it was these similar companies that were dominant in the pesticide sector. An interesting aspect, I would have thought that the livestock industry would have been against um, synthetic meat, but actually um, in the US and in Australia, as well as in the EU, the livestock um, industry lobbying group is that tends to be on board with synthetic meat. I think they're probably preempting that if it kind of like what taxi should have done with Uber, they're, pre they're preempting what could happen in this space. And they're saying, well, actually it could increase the value to our farmers because we could then charge more for real meat. Um, and then synthetic meat um, will be the cheaper one that, uh, as you can imagine, food insecure, poorer people would eat as a, then the richer people will be enjoying uh, real meat. So th there is that discourse there because they believe that right now they get $50 sorry, a kilogram of mince and they think in the future that with 3D printed food in cartridges, they might receive 300 per kilo if it's real meat. Oh, and in terms of the cultural religious requirements, no one has really picked up on this yet, um, which is quite disappointing, but I guess it's because the literature is really coming from a Eurocentric um, white people space. As a, but there is a problem I, I perceive with synthetic meat in terms of meeting particular religious requirements around how um, animals are killed and then eaten. So that is a significant issue there. 
that hasn't really been discussed. But that's because it puts a damper on the hype. OK, so in terms of likely technological trajectories, I think that um, in the short term, they're really going to be focusing on scale as opposed to um, whether it tastes that good. Um, they're really going to be focusing on getting it to scale in a way that they can mass produce and then create a huge segment of the market that eats synthetic meat products. IP is a significant part of this, and it really is focused on the methods. So far, patents have come up around the methods um, used to regenerate tissues in the, in the specific area of beef and other um, livestock, and also the process of 3D printing meat in a particular pattern um, to create the, tech, the right kind of texture. So IP will definitely be involved in this technological trajectory that we see occurring. We'll also see probably niche, like I think synthetic meat might start off as a niche market that is more expensive and then slowly become the cheaper substitute for real meat. So IP would have a complicated relationship with this. It could hinder innovation, especially if you have, um, if regenerative tissue medicine for humans is um, similar to um, the meat, um, what we want to do with meat, but you can see that the different patents in that area might restrict the sharing of information, um, cross fertilization of ideas and things like that. So IP could hinder that kind of cumulative innovation that we might want to see earlier on. It also reduces transparency. And that generally isn't an issue, but it is when it comes to food. Um, and what Matthew was saying before about transparency of um, the need to regulate well earlier on is particularly important with food because people are always more cautious um, about the safety of their food than perhaps the safety of their air. So there's just something to think about there is that IP will reduce transparency, which could have flow on effects for um, consumer acceptability of the product. Um, and that's certainly what we saw with GM earlier on, quite strict patents. The first time patents were being applied to seeds, this really did spark um, a lot of backlash and fear. So besides IP, um, there's food safety labelling in animal welfare and processing um, laws that need to be dealt with or standards. So in Australia, it's, it's, we have a really fragmented approach to regulating food similar to the US and that will affect um, 3D printed meat products because um, if they're taking place all within the one um, one process or one area, you'd expect multiple departments to be regulating the same thing. So we have Fizance, which is the Food Standards Body of Australia and New Zealand. They provide food safety, manufacturing and labelling standards for Australia and New Zealand. They set broad health goals and they work closely with industry um, and public health professionals, but mainly industry, um, to create food standards um, going forward. So we would expect that 3D printed meat companies will be heavily involved in how we regulate our um, products should we get to that point. Meanwhile, RSPCA largely enforces animal welfare, which is quite interesting considering you would have thought that'd be more in the government periphery than a non-for-profit. But RSPCA largely enforces animal welfare laws, so they will have to come up with um, codes of practice, for instance, in regards to synthetic meat. The US is even more fragmented um, because the US has a department that regulates meat and then a department that sets the standards on food. So um, how they'll overcome that um, will be interesting if, if we get to that point. Because of the novelty of the product, um, and it's going to be consumed by humans, we're going to see a lot of pre-market assessment of this and maybe countries reaching different um, decisions about whether it's safe or not and then potentially trade disputes based on if, if jurisdictions have different ideas about what's safe. Um, if we're looking at what type of model we could adopt going forward, the European government has a really transparent food regulation system, or at least comparatively transparent, because they've had a number of food scares, whereas Australia, we're quite, um, we've got strong biosecurity laws, so we haven't been as affected. Um, I guess one other thing I would say is that in terms of food labelling requirements, and this is more of a stab in the dark based on previous decisions, but I think it's likely that synthetic meat will at least initially be labelled as synthetic meat and that real meat will um, just be normal meat products with no differentiation. Um, and that, I mean, but it would be interesting to know what would go on there. And if, if the meat and livestock body is on board with 3D printing, perhaps there wouldn't be as much um, backlash or, or perhaps choice the consumer agency group would want more transparency there and, and clarity. Um, so 
just before I conclude, one of the things I've been thinking about is whether 3D printing of synthetic meat products is really as exciting um, as I thought that it would be initially and as I hoped it would be, as my expectations were, um, as sociologists would say. Um, and it really does avoid asking difficult questions, which is why I quite liked it as a conflicted meat eater. I liked the idea that we could have victimless meat. I, and so it does avoid those difficult questions because I thought, oh, this is great. We don't have to talk about you know, complex regulatory interventions to promote more plant-based diets. We can just print meat. You know, um, and it sounds amazing, but actually um, it isn't as easy or as simple as I thought it would be, and that's where the hype, that's where the hype got me. So there's two, about two key issues. Firstly, you still need blood and cells to grow the synthetic meat. Um, so you, there's still um, animal lives being lost in the process, and actually it's quite a lot of blood, so I'm not quite, they're not sure how they're gonna scale that. Um, also, um, they can't, can't currently scale it to the right level where they have these large processing vats that they require. So we're not there yet in terms of the technology. There's some significant hurdles in terms of scaling it up. I have thought maybe you could have decentralised production where they, you just print the meat in your own home. But then I realised, of course, you'd still have to have the inputs. So you'd still need the industrial vat size um, factory set up to create the synthetic meat product. Now, an interesting study has come out, and uh, look, it's, it's quite a restricted study. It's focused in the US, et cetera. It has um, limitations, but it examines, it compares the potential greenhouse gas emissions from um, meat print, uh, synthetic meat to uh, normal beef livestock, which in the US is um, mainly in factory farms. And you can see on this slide that um, they compared if you scale the synthetic meat products up to that industrial level, it would be relatively the same, if not worse, in terms of greenhouse gas emissions. And a big part of that is the waste that's generated from these systems. So there are other ways to reduce livestock production other than a, a techno fix, and they're less sexy for the media and for us, um, and they're not likely to attract um, grant funding as, as much. But there are ways that we should be considering as well in this synthetic meat um, discourse and promoting other alternatives, which are just things like reducing meat consumption via clever taxation or um, increasing the diversity of meat products available so we can reduce the impact um, earlier on, so you know, kangaroo, etc. Um, and it, you could also incentivize the uptake of mixed farm cropping and animal livestock systems, which also have shown to have great benefits in terms of climate mitigation and adaptation, as well as food security. So. Um, I am quite, now I'm becoming a little bit more critical of 3D printed and synthetic meat products. Um, so yeah, that's where I've, that's where I'm basically at with my thinking on it. Thank you. Um, I've got some time for questions, so I'd like to invite Thomas to come back up uh, to the front. Um, does anyone have any questions for either of the uh, I might go with, uh, with the gentleman at the back first. Uh, yeah, question for Hope. Kind of on the last part of the last topic you addressed on techno fixes. Do you feel that, uh, especially in the developing world, increased consumption of this synthetic meat could kind of lead to an even further increased reliance on Western IP protected products? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, because right now the technology is mainly being developed in the EU and the US, there isn't a lot of other areas looking into synthetic meat. So you're seeing similar dynamics with the GM. And then I've been thinking about whether you patent the meat products that came out of the printer, whether the patent would continue in that product. And I kind of compared it with crops and GM and I thought probably would. Um, so you do face similar cross-contamination issues. Um, I would expect similar dynamics to play out based on that kinds of actors that are investing in this area. But I would have hoped that with emerging economies, you might have seen more diversity in actors, and that still might happen. But um, yeah, right now it looks fairly similar. Yeah. Uh, so I'm afraid it's another question for Hope, but I'll oh, okay. <laughs> throw up the tongue. So this is um, one of the things that, that we routinely do in collaboration with our colleague Christine Critchley from Swinburne University is work out what public attitudes are towards technology and one way is to do nationwide surveys. We did one which included questions on 3D printing last year 
looking at things like perceived safety and intended use. And food was way out of kilter with everything else, so far more concerns about safety, far less intention to use than to say artificial uh, joints or mm. 3D printed car parts and everything. Questions. Does that surprise you? No, and you know what I think it might not surprise me about is, and I, I'm not actually basing this on anything, just thoughts on a bus, but um, we have all experienced food poisoning, whereas we haven't experienced a limb in our body going wild. So I think it's just that we've experienced food poisoning and so we assign a higher value to it, but also, um, there's something to be said about the lack of transparency in our supply chains, which means we put so much trust, uh, I know we're gonna go into lunch soon, but on the safety <laughs> of our food and on other people. Um, and I think that that's a lot of fear comes from that as well, because it's out of our control. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Concerns would be the first thing that people will talk about uh, before anything else, before taking, talking about technology or any uh, related matter. But I'm still, um, I haven't seen much research, and I, I there, don't know. There is nothing on, um, for instance, Islamic interpretations of synthetic meat. Yeah. There is nothing on that, and I think that really is telling of um, where the technology is being developed, um, and and by who. Um, but I think that. At social scientists, and this is where I spruik all of us, um, except for the actual scientists. Um, yeah, I think with social scientists coming in, we can open up that that room for critique. Um, but I agree. I think there, it does show a lot about who, where the power lies in the development of this technology, and whose interests are being served. Mm -hmm. Just a basic question, even about the name, synthetic. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm telling you, I love, yeah. I love it. Go. Yeah. <laughs> does, does the manufacturers or someone who is producing this even think about the, that the name actually sends some negative signal? At least for me, just hearing it for the first time, think that it's kind of scared. Okay. Yeah. Even though you don't, the content might be good, but there might be some People use different terms for it. I chose synthetic meat because um, it's easy to say, whereas some of the other ones are a bit more difficult. And also some of them are more political, like Frankenburger. Um, <laughs> yeah, cellular, cellular agriculture is the term that's being used. I quite like that. But I agree synthetic meat is, a, and we haven't settled on a term yet that everyone uses. So we'll see, how, and also it's similar. I wonder if something will happen similar to GM food where we had GM, but now they're using like CRISPR and other words to sort of hide, not hide, but they're using a different terminology to what everyone was using. So you do wonder mm, if the technology will change terminology. Yeah, I just want to uh, view the issue in a different angle. Sorry about this. The issue like, uh, what you say, food, uh, free printing of food, how, uh, how different uh, That's okay. Lunch, I'm telling you, it's just low energy. Um, I might take just another couple of questions to this gentleman here. Yeah, okay. I've got a question for Thomas. Um, I, like, I like the ethical production of filaments uh, for recycling materials, but obviously in medical applications, you, you want to be really sure that you've got safe materials to start with. Do you, do you see any, any way of, of having this sort of ethical production of materials Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's again, we have quite here a strong distinction between food, printing food, and objects. But in fact, many of the materials we use, such as polymers, from corn, a corn, like corn base, for example. Um, so yeah, the, the purity of the material is key. Um, 
And one, one thing that is being innovated at Wollongong now is actually seaweed based, you know, um, bio inks and so on. Um, so yeah, I think um, the, it, the, the key thing is the supply chains. And so can you use, for example, local resources perhaps in it and make precision materials? And I think then if you could start doing those kind of things, you'd really start seeing, I guess, benefits for development. One final question, if anyone. Or just, just really a, a question um, for Thomas in terms of the, the raging debate over 3D printing and environmental sustainability. And I, I think both your books are really excellent at tackling that kind of question of, you know, is 3D printing part of a circular economy that will lead to more sustainable outcomes or will it lead to much more of a junk and waste economy. Mm. Uh, do, do you want to just um, finish up by elaborating upon some of your discussions about 3D printing and environmental sustainability? Yeah, I mean, it, can, it, it almost can go both ways in many cases and even in the food case as well. I mean, um, perhaps many of the innovations for 3D printing food will be in, for example, chocolate production or in making donuts. I mean, that's an extrusion technology as well. And it's the same thing with object production as well. We have both, for example, development um, objectives being met, but also you could have it going the other way. And this is something I think 3D printing is very unsettling um, for many of us, and I think it's going to continue to be the case. And as well, we, we have the hype cycles, but you know, it could be more democratic, but it could also much be, be much less democratic. You can imagine it being mm. used to actually close down IP and close down patent um, law and so on. So. Yeah, I think it's one of these things which is an, an unsettling kind of innovation and it will continue to do that. And um, yeah, I think it, it makes us think more about the systems that we mm. rely on. Mm. Perhaps that's the most, I think, um, interesting thing about it for me mm. anyway.